So, Abby, tell me about this movie of yours. I'm so excited about it. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks for having me. Um, so the movie's called Cram. Um, it's uh, an indie horror film. It's coming out March 17th on Tubi and on demand and streaming elsewhere, Prime Video, Google Play. Um, the movie, it really started before the pandemic um, as this... Well, I guess I'll start at the beginning, really. You know, growing up, um, school was like a nightmare for me. Uh, and Cram, it really began as this attempt to get that nightmare out of my head. Um, and I think what was really interesting was as I invited more people to make the movie with me, and I want to stress that like movies are not made alone. So many tremendous artists worked with me to make Cram. And um, one of the things we all shared that was whether we had been good students or bad students, we all had this same nightmare. And I'm sure it's a nightmare that you've had as well, Sammy. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that while it began then as this desire to get that nightmare out of my head to exercise my own academic demons, um, it really evolved, the whole movie really evolved into this attempt to interrogate like why the universal experience of school is fear. Like, what are we also afraid of? Um, and so the movie is about this very poor student named Mark who is struggling late at night to study for an exam, or sorry, to finish his final paper. And um, like a dream that I've had, he wakes up in the middle of the night in the library after having dozed off to discover that his paper's gone missing. Um, and that's just the beginning of the movie. It gets way worse from there. And it really kind of explores these existential terrors that I think we all have. That is amazing. What would you say was the biggest challenge about making this? I mean, I know you said it started pre-pandemic, so I figured that was a big challenge of, as well. Yeah, you know, the thing about making indie movies is like everything is hard. Um, it's, you know, so exhilarating and it was incredibly rewarding to be able to make this movie during the pandemic. Um, we had a lot of unusual circumstances because of the pandemic. You know, we had to shut down production for nine months. And during that time, we were not sure that we would ever get to finish the movie. So that was tremendously challenging. But at the same time, there was this very strange benefit where we were suddenly sitting on half of a movie and had the ability to look at that footage, edit it together, and really consider that when we got to make the rest of the movie, were there changes we would make? Was there additional material we wanted to get? And we really kind of reconceived of the rest of the movie during that long hiatus. And as a result, I think Cram is much richer. And, you know, one of the things that I think any filmmaker might tell you is that every film is sort of a lesson in its own making. And when you finish a movie, you've become an expert in making that movie. But the problem is you never get to apply those lessons because the next movie is totally different. But Cram had this amazing experience where the lessons we learned from making Cram, we were able to apply to Cram. So that was really cool. Nice. And how did you come up with the cast? Because that I'm pretty excited about too. Thanks. Yeah, I think we have such a tremendous cast. You know, the two leads, John Domino and Brandon Burton. Um, I met Brandon actually over 10 years ago um, working on a waffle truck in New York City. Uh, we He's, I think, he's, you know, one of the actors of his generation, in my opinion. Um, he's so good and I've been so lucky to, to see him grow in his abilities. He's a very gifted Shakespeare actor. His character, who is, you know, the monster in the movie, who, spoilers, speaks in iambic pentameter and, spe you know, speaks in Shakespearean verse. Brandon is one of the only actors I can imagine in the world who's capable of not just bringing life to that sort of dialogue, but also making it, you know, feel contemporary, feel present in a sort of monstrous way. And that was such a collaboration that you could really only do with a friend because he helped me write that dialogue. He's an expert in verse. It was a collaboration. I wrote the part with him in mind. Um, and then John, on the other hand, I actually met at a film festival with my last film. He um, was a friend of a friend and we were introduced. And that night at the awards ceremony for this festival, he won best actor in the film he was in. Uh, and so I thought, well, that's probably someone I should get to know. And when I wrote Cram, I asked him to audition because I think that his energy really spoke to me for this part. And, you know, what he does in the movie is so challenging because he spends much of the movie alone in the library and he has no scene partner other than the stacks. And I think the ability to track what's going on inside of his head on his face is it's so fluid for John that he makes it look easy, but it's one of the hardest things in the world. And that was what we were looking for when we casted that part. It's incredible. And uh, what's one scene without giving too much away you're looking forward to everybody seeing? Oh man, um, it's a great question. Uh, there are a lot of moments in Cram that I, I'm really proud of. I think they're the scene where we are introduced to Brandon's character um, late in the movie. Um, there's a big reveal of his character. He is, you know, this, the movie's in some ways about the, 
the metaphor of our, our academic system as a vampire. This idea of, you know, we live in a society where academia is very vampiric. Um, it's a strange vampire because people are willing to sort of sell themselves to it. Um, and yet, in my mind, that makes it all the more villainous. And so when we first meet this character, it, there's this shot, a long reveal, a long tracking shot over a table. And my cinematographer, Felix Hanta, with whom I've been making movies for over 10 years as well, um, really knocked that shot out of the park. But when you pull off a shot like that, it's this you know long, slow move. You're kind of investing in the potential of the shot when you get it, because without the right score, without the right sound design. Um, oh, hello. still recording but i'll pause that over there we go so where do we leave off um you asked me uh about a scene i'm excited for people to see. yes yes so to sum it up there's a scene where we reveal the villain the the monster in the movie yeah. um, i think it's a really exciting scene i think it's a great marriage of the work of our composer daniel rudin our sound designer daniela hart our cinematographer's work uh the character itself is you know a, a collaboration between brandon the actor but also our special effects makeup artist, Beatrice Sniper, our costume designer, Alexander Nyman. And I think that the cool thing about cool that thing. scene is it's sort of seamless and exciting, but behind the scenes, we had to make this incredible investment where we you know, did this long tracking shot and then said, well, unless we find a composer who can really make an incredible orchestral piece of music on an indie film's budget, then this moment is really not going to work very well. And so we're so lucky to have found Dan. And it's it just makes me so excited every time I see that uh, moment in the theater. Um, for festivals because we can, you know, it's a celebration of all of that work and it's really exciting. So I can't wait for people to watch it at home. Nice. And what's next for you? Um, I am uh, writing what I hope will be my next movie. Um, it's a romance, actually, uh, although with a twist. It's called Come Again Soon, and it's about um, a woman who is having an affair with a married man who dies tragically choking on a hot dog at a fast food hot dog restaurant. And because it was an affair in order to bury the secret um, of the affair, she can't talk to anyone. And so she has all this shame and guilt. And so the only person she can talk to is the hot dog company's brand account. And the two of them eventually form a relationship. So that's what I'm working on. Wow, what inspired that one? Oh man, um, Twitter, unfortunately. <laughs> I saw a tweet from, um, I, I, over the years, I saw you know brand Twitter sort of progressively becoming more um, human seeming more emotionally distinct. And I remember seeing a tweet from Sunny D that said, I can't do this anymore. Um, like Sunny D, the juice drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was the most insane thing I'd ever seen. It really just sent me spiraling. And I thought, like, is that the person who writes tweets for Sunny D saying that they're depressed? Is that Sunny D itself as a figure saying that it can't do this anymore? And then all these other brands started replying, saying, like, oh, Sunny, I can, you know. I can give you a hug or like, you got this sunny stay in there. And I was so disarmed by this kind of performance of human emotion on the sort of corporate level, but at the same time, watching people interact with it, that I started thinking, well, what are the limits of this? What happens if these corporations aren't just, you know, conveying the like appearance of human emotion, but actually feel it? What happens if a corporation falls in love was sort of the germination of that. That's cute. I like that. And what I got like asking people I interview was tell me a fun fact about yourself. A fun fact about myself. Um, that's a fun question. Uh, um, wow. I feel like I sound really boring because I can't come up with anything. Um, a fun fact about myself is um, I have a twin sister oh, okay. who is a farmer. Um, and she actually, I think, has achieved more in the entertainment business than I ever will because she appeared as herself on Sesame Street which is amazing. So it's actually really encouraging in some ways because it, it alleviated the burden of my ambitions. I know I'll never achieve anything as cool as, as that. So it's nice to just have my twin sister out there kind of crushing it. What kind of role did she play? A farmer, I'm guessing, but when was yeah, it? She, so she, they actually went to her farm. So she's an urban farmer. She works on Randall's Island in New York City. Uh, and she is the farm manager there. Um, and they went to her farm and she played herself. Her name is Ciara. And you can follow her on Instagram and everything. Um, and she played a character called Farmer C and uh, just helped kids learn about growing tomatoes. That is amazing. I like that. I've got yeah, to check that really out and show it to my niece. Yeah, seriously. I'm sure she'll love it. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing also, I like asking people I interview is tell me uh, what you're watching these days. Great question. Um, you know, I recently, for the first time, watched Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, the Francis Ford Coppola movie from the 90s with okay. and Anthony Hopkins and Gary Oldman as Dracula. And it blew me away for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the biggest was that its DNA is all over Cram, and I had no idea. I actually sometimes think people will watch Cram and think that, like, I ripped Dracula off. And I swear I had never seen it until this past summer. And it's so beautiful. And there are literal images in that movie that directly evoke some of the images in Cram. But I think that something Coppola does that I really respond to is the use of Dracula, not just as a scary figure, but as a sort of reflection of our own, you know, internal battle for, between lust and you know, uh, purity and all all these things that are going on inside of us, the battle for good and evil within us is is conveyed so beautifully through this like monstrous figure. Amazing. Nice. And where can we find you on social media so we can continue to follow your amazing career? Thank you. Um, you can find me on Twitter. That's probably where I'm most active. My username is A B Seidel. That's the first two letters of my first name. So A B S I D E L L. Um, and I have the same username on Instagram. Um, I'm also on Letterboxd, uh, which I love using Letterboxd. Um, you know, the cool thing about being an indie filmmaker is uh, I'm not unable to contact, like I'm not out of reach. We're not Hollywood people or anything. So you can go on Letterboxd. You can write a review about Cram. Like I might engage. We can have a conversation about the movie. One of the most wonderful things about sharing Cram with people has been the opportunity to to experience people on the festival circuit connect with the movie in their own ways. I, we've had people come up to us and say, oh man, that's just like my Tuesday, or that's exactly like my experience of school. And I also think that we're at this really interesting turning point in the state of indie cinema where, you know, audiences are so flooded with options and a platform like Tubi where you can watch Cram is growing in popularity because audiences know it's where they can find movies that take risks. And I think that it's really exciting when you find a movie that speaks to you. So I feel so lucky that Cram is part of what I see as this sort of vanguard of, of a new wave of indie movies being released to people that are actually hungry for them. So if you find Cram and if you're a broke college student and you don't have to spend $20 to watch it, it's free and you can and share it with people and everyone can watch it and we can have a conversation about it. Wonderful. Well, Ibi, it was a pleasure to speak to you. I can't wait to speak to you again soon and congratulations on the movie. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. You have a great day. Likewise. Thank you. Bye. Bye.